Hey, it's Andrew Morgan, host of the NOMCAST, the Netflix original movie podcast. Each week, we review the biggest Netflix original movies with special guests from the film industry, the music industry, comedians, and of course, our fellow podcasters. Check us out on the web at nomcastpod.com. Follow us on the socials at nomcastpod. And most importantly, listen and subscribe to us wherever you get podcasts. Hit that beat one time. Hey, I'm Shamar. And I'm Andrew. We're going to be doing a deep dive on all the connected DC animated movies and their cinematic universe. Yes, I'm here to discuss the interconnected storylines and point out how jacked everybody is. And I'm here to share a deep comic book knowledge like Batman having his own sneaker line. So check out yet another DC animated podcast. Part of the Forgotten Entertainment family and coming soon wherever you listen to your podcast. And welcome, Nerdy Knights at the Well-Rounded Table to Bohemian Geek Studies, where we take extremely dorky dives into our favorite fandoms. I'm Colleen McMillan, Jedi Master and Rebel Scum Collaborator. And this is I, Pirate Jedi, <laughs> Anders Drew. And I'm just so happy, guys. I'm very happy this week. <laughs> yes, as you should be. As you should. Banger, banger episode for Hondo. <laughs> I also I also procure treasure and proton bombs because you know every situation could be profitable. That's true. But no matter what rank you carry, one thing will always remain constant. Much to learn, we still have. Especially about Hondo. <laughs> yes. Hidden depths to that guy. <laughs> this season on Bohemian Geek Studies, we are taking our detailed dorky dive into Star Wars Rebels, and today we're diving into season three episodes. 7, 8, and 9, which are called Imperial Super Commandos, Iron Squadron, and I'm going to butcher this name, y'all, the Winkathu job. It's better than I would have done. So <laughs> We're going to say up. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> we have done our best to scramble our signature, and we'll be avoiding spoilers. I mean, sometimes we may say that we're deliberately avoiding a spoiler. <laughs> But I will throw in an adult content warning for the younglings, Ezra, Sabine, and that jetpack. Whew. Yep. Woo! <laughs> but without further ado, let's hop on board the Phantom 2. Don't scratch the paint. We just got it. And head back to Concord Dawn as we explore our holocrons of knowledge. Colleen, let's punch it and open that first holocron. You got it. We're heading into our first holocron, the Journal of the Wills, where we go over the plot episode synopses for this week's episodes. We're starting with episode seven, which is Imperial Super Commandos. It opens above the planet Adelon with Sabine playing a game of Cubicad, also not sure if you how you say that, against prisoner of the rebellion and for the rebellion, Fenrau, leader of the Mandalorian protectors. I love him. <laughs> I just gotta throw that in there. I do love Fenrau, even if he's the dick this episode. Sabine tries to persuade Rao and his protectors to join the rebellion while he tries persuading her to join him in the fight for Mandalore. Zeb interrupts them to bring them into the briefing room, both of them, where Hera informs the Spectres and Commander Sato that they have lost contact with the Protector's base on the third moon of Conquer Dawn. Oopsies. Sato thinks it's a trap because reasonably, yes, it probably is, Mm -hmm. but Rao suspects something bad has happened. Mm. So he, Sabine, Ezra, and Chopper travel to the base to check it out and Rao manages to knock out Ezra and stun Sabine with the blaster because oh, of course Ezra's, Ezra's not paying attention. <laughs> Eventually, they find Rao and discover that the Protector's camp has been attacked by other Mandalorians. Ooh, thought we were beyond the infighting. Mm. Mm. So <laughs> Ezra, Sabine, and Rao are then attacked by a probe droid. Gotta love a, an appearance by a probe droid. Probe droid. <laughs> before an army of Mandalorians who serve the Empire approach them. These guys look Mm. slick. They do look really cool. (laughs) Ezra and Chopper are taken into custody as the Imperial Mandalorian leader reveals himself as Gar Saxon, orders his men to search the area for the others. Ezra denies being a rebel. Uh, First, he says he's Lando Calrissian and he's part of Hondo Anaka's crew. You know what? This is a more believable story than Jabba the Hutt. If you call up Hondo, he'd be like, I know that guy. (laughs) Exactly. <laughs> but Saxon and the Empire know that the Empires have that the rebels have been using Concordon as a through way to avoid sector patrols. Mm-hmm. Rao wants to sacrifice Ezra and just get the hell out of Dodge. But Sabine knows that the Empire cannot get their hands on the Phantom 2 because it carries the coordinates to their base on Avalon. Mm-hmm. <sighs> 
Rao agrees to help get revenge against Saxon and proposes a truce with Sabine. He'll secure the ship. Sabina can free Sabine can free Ch- Ezra and Chopper. Yeah, that seems like it's totally gonna work out fine. Yeah, great yeah, idea. Sabine, like, oh my god, it's a yeah, good let's plan. Listen to fucking Fenral. Sabine, Sabine you're Jenner. smarter than this. Ugh. As Sabine and Rao put their plan into action, Ezra uses the Force twice to save Chopper from Saxon, who's trying moment. to shoot him in the head. That's just not right. Which prompts Saxon to realize that Ezra is much more valuable than he first thought as a question Jedi. About, question about this moment, though. I mean, I would think that Ezra is, like, good enough with the Force now that he doesn't have to do the whole close your eyes close two-hand eyes, thing. Yeah. Like, he could probably just do, like, a finger flick, like... Yeah. Well, well, <laughs> you would hope so. Maybe it's because he's panicking that he kind of just goes back to his old ways. But you would hope in front of people he wouldn't do this. Yeah. But he does because it's Ezra, and what can we expect from Ezra? Sabine comes in and saves Ezra and Chopper, but Rao steals the Phantom too, because of course he does. Saxon realizes Sabine recognizes realizes. Mm. Saxon recognizes Sabine as House Wren, and Sabine pretends to yield to him before getting Chopper to send a disorienting feedback into the Mandalorian's helmets, leaving them writhing in pain. Good work, Sabine. Amazing. No notes. She grabs Ezra in maybe one of the funniest moments in all of Rebels. <laughs> and flies away on a stolen jetpack and there's a race to Saxon's ship Mm, he's got his little gauntlet that they're going for before Saxon and crew can kill the rebels Rao arrives thank the freaking gods and announces that the rebels are under his protection like get away from my kids bitch like (laughs) I was a little surprised there that uh that the Mandalorians didn't catch them a little sooner because I mean yes Sabine has a jetpack but she's also carrying the weight of two people (laughs) yes yes she is Maybe they were finally nervous about Chopper being flying around near them too. <laughs> finally. Like, can we not disregard the droid? Like, for fuck's sake. He probably has a missile stash in there somewhere. He probably does. <laughs> knowing Chopper, he's got <laughs> knives and shit in there too. So Saxon's like, nah, these kids are mine and so are you, Fen Rao. But Rao basks him with the ship's frontal cannons mm-hmm, and the rebels escape. As they travel back to safety, this is a really sweet moment. Rao agrees to join the rebellion, and Sabine welcomes him into the family. Aww. Very sweet. Yes, and a nice little callback to the uh, to the opening of the episode. Mm-hmm. Next up is episode eight, Iron Squadron. Mm-hmm. We see the ghost kids. in this. Oh, <laughs> fucking kids. <laughs> Times I'm glad I don't have any. <laughs> we see the ghost in a Phoenix Cell Hammerhead Corvette arrive above the planet Mikapo where the Galactic Empire has has a base. Uh, the Rebels are there to evacuate Rebel sympathizers when they spot a freighter in space distracting some TIE fighters. Hera contacts the freighter and warns them to get the, out of there. Like, we can help you escape now. But a very young male voice declines the offer, saying that the Iron Squadron doesn't run. Later in the common room, Hera and Ezra contact Commander Sato, who explains the Iron Squadron was led by his late brother, who is now dead. Yeah. His nephew Killed by the Empire. Yeah. His nephew, Mart, turns out to be the captain of, on the freighter. And Sato plans pleads with them to bring his nephew safely back to Adelon. He also he wants to go get him too. And they're like, you are way too far away yeah, to make no. any difference here, dude. Yeah, don't no. We're not risking you on one kid, even if he is your family. So we have the ghost docking with the freighter and the team meet. Feeling, I love her so much. Oh, yeah. Gutierrez, which is based off someone who we'll talk about later, John Urgin and Mart Matten. Not same last name as Sato. We're going to cover that later, too. Turns out the ship's hyperdrive isn't working. Shocking that a Corellian ship's hyperdrive is not working. Here in Forbes, Mart, that they're there to rescue him and his crew. But he doesn't want to run away like a coward. Hmm, interesting. On an Imperial Star Destroyer above Lothal, an Imperial officer and Admiral Constantine enter the command bridge to brief Grand Admiral Thrawn about the Iron Squadron and its attack on an advanced patrol with the help of the ghost. He's like, aha, the ghost. Mm. I know who they are. Thrawn orders Makapo to be locked down. He's going to catch some people. Back on the ghost, Ezra convinces Hera to let him try to convince the Iron Squadron to come with them again. So Sabine, Chopper, and R3. I love R3. Three. Joint I always like those like really tall, those tall R- yes. R2 units. Yes, They're... it might not be like super useful, but it's really cute. 
and you can hide very small like kernels in there from yes, the yes, phone you can. <laughs> you can you can hide in there it's, it's gonna be fine mart orders his crew to go to battle stations though because they got company the specters and our squadron head to the cockpit and discover that an imperial light cruiser and two gazanti class cruisers have exited hyperspace and are like spitting out tie Wait, fighters that's not like a star business. destroyer what there's one Just, no honey no, sit no. down <laughs> and not in the captain's chair like no I need to take you back to school for god's sake mark refuses to listen to reason and flies toward the imperial ships while john and gucci try to reason with their captain as the ship's power breaks down mart finally agrees to go and the two rebel cells flee into the phantom 2 however mart changes his mind disengages the airlock once everyone's aboard and is like bye Escape, like run away. Mart, you don't mm, have to be a Mart. Mart. I do feel bad for him. Somewhat. I do too. Mm -hmm. Mart charges at Constantine's light cruiser and releases his cargo full of explosives, but the light cruiser cruiser survives because they are able to shoot down all of the crates yeah. and deploys some extra Tie fighters that knock out Mart's engine, leaving him completely stranded. Before jumping into hyperspace, Ezra tells Mart that he and his rebel cell will come back for him. Hera promises Sato that they will go back and rescue Mart. Again, Sato is like, I will do this. And they're like, no, not only are we just not risking you, you are too far away. <laughs> Little do they know. <laughs> yes. When the Imperial officer reports the ghost presence, Constantine vows to destroy both ships and orders his subordinate not to trigger the mine that they have placed on one of the last remaining cargo crate mm -hmm. um, until he's ordered it. Hera sends Chopper and a very <laughs> unwilling R3 to disable the detonator and turn off the magnetic field, which they do after <laughs> Chopper shoves R3 out the airlock. <laughs> Yeet! It's <laughs> time to go! <laughs> Dato so arrives with some rebel reinforcements, including some A-wings. <laughs> Mart manages to damage Constantine's ship with the mine, setting the ship ablaze. Mm -hmm. While the ghosts get Sato's hammer to safety, they encounter a actual Imperial Star Destroyer. Here comes the Chimera, and the, everybody. And the Iron Squadron is just like, oh. oh shit. Hey, look, it's got some cool snakes on it, too. We're like, yeah, no, that's not cool. We got to get out of here. <laughs> With Thrawn and Bullard, who contacts Sato and promises that they will meet again. Thrawn gives Constantine a bit of a dressing down for letting the rebels escape. <laughs> This is great. Constantine's like, yes. the rebels have been driven from the system. You mean the most valuable prize that we wanted has escaped unharmed. You said you could do it with one <laughs> ship. <laughs> oh, uh, Hera, Zeb, and Ezra watch and smile as the Iron Squadron rebels embrace with Mart mm -hmm. as they are reunited back on Adelon. And he, yeah. Mart does ultimately embrace his uncle for coming to mm -hmm. save him. That part is really sweet. I yeah. wish we got more of Sato. I, I do think too. He could have been a really interesting character to give more depth to in Rebels. We do get a little bit more of him, but it was like, let's give him more. We, Jun Sato's got a lot to do. Okay, last but not least, episode 10. What? Are we on nine? Yes, nine. <laughs> entitled The Wincanthu Job. I'm going to butcher that every single time, folks. Featuring Hondo and biggest douche in the fucking galaxy, as Morgan. Ugh. Hondo has a deal for the rebels. All the weapons aboard an abandoned class four container transport. Mm, lots of shit on there, including proton bombs. They're going to need it. So they head towards the planet Wincanthu. Good lord. It's in this outline way too many times. Unfortunately, the ship is slowly being pulled inside the planet's atmospheric storm. Not great. Meaning it's if a tractor beam be couldn't destroyed. have just like lifted it out. Like the ghost engines, the ghost engines are still able to get in and out of there. Like, can't I they? I wonder if they do. They have a tractor, like a strong. They don't have a tractor beam? beam, but if the ghost can get in and out of that atmosphere, like, do they just need to restore enough power mm. to fly it out? <laughs> I don't know if it had enough power left in the ship like something was wrong something had been disabled or they couldn't escape yeah. the atmosphere i think like not quite enough a star destroyer might have been able to get it out of there but they were like now eh, we're too busy we don't really need yeah, it's just a write-off <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly you can write this off on our taxes so we're on this planet the rebels want the bombs unfortunately hondo and s morgan are not interested in the bombs they're interested in treasure which is going to be a few which they were very upfront about 
they were upfront about it. They're like, yeah, we're not really here for that. You guys, <laughs> you guys get the bombs. We get the treasure. We get the treasure. Exactly. You know, enter RA7 protocol droid AP5. AP5. <laughs> I mean, was it too much to have Hondo and AP in I one episode? I texted you that during this. When I was watching this episode, I was like, this might be too much comedy to put AP5 in Hondo in an episode. It's too powerful to have these two comedic geniuses on this freaking show. And two, having um, as Morgan also is another comedic part. Like, yeah, this, this is just a st- chock full episode of funny, which is basically what it is. It's a humor episode, everybody. So they get on the transport and Zeb is in charge. Hera puts Zeb in charge, which pisses off Ezra a little bit. He wants to lead the team, you know. It's his but- job. Hera's like, no, you don't think straight when it comes to Hondo. So we're going to put Zeb in charge because he actually doesn't trust Hondo and neither do any of us. So this is fine. And Sabine stays behind to accept the cargo when they send it back over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the rebels on the ship split up. Chopper heads to try and restore some of the ship's power systems. Mm -hmm. Zeb, along with Ezra, Hondo, and Az Morgan, travel down the corridor where they run into (laughs) other than... Hondo's former <laughs> former crewmate and laborer that they freed earlier, the Ugnot Melch. The <laughs> love Melch. Poor <laughs> Melch. It feels so bad for him. Turns out Hondo and Az Morgan had actually already tried to claim the bounty on this ship, but they failed. And they abandoned Melch, leaving him to die. Very, very no. No. You do not. Mills is precious. <laughs> even after he like punches Hondo, he just like flashes them that smile. <laughs> it's just like, oh. <laughs> oh my god. Yes. So they as compensation as compensation for this, Hondo offers Melch two percent of the treasure, which the mm-hmm. Ugnot happily accepts. Okay. Meanwhile, Hera, Cannon, and AP five are aboard the Ghost Bridge, and Sabine reports that the winds are getting very strong. Mm -hmm. Uh, The crew then finds the cargo hold. They get the treasure and the proton bombs. Zeb orders Chopper to open the cargo door so they can start transferring the bounty back onto the ghost. Mm -hmm. In the background, a DT series sentry droid reactivates. Not a good thing. Scary looking thing. It's like a very, very scary. (laughs) Like a very advanced B2. Yes, exactly. And that is kind of what it evokes. In the viewer who has watched Clone Wars, they're kind of like, oh shit, this mm-hmm. is not going to be fun for anybody. Zeb and Ezra start loading the bombs until Ezra starts helping Hondo load his treasure, which come on, Ezra. Ezra. I love Hondo, but it. no. No, just don't do this. They notice that as Morgan is missing, shocking. So Zeb goes off to find him, only to be stunned by one of those sentry droids. Sabine receives the fourth batch of proton bombs, but then a lightning strike causes the cargo ship to list toward the vortex. Mm, not great for anyone. Ezra tells Hera about the development with everybody's missing. <laughs> also, <laughs> yeah, also we we've lost Zeb and we've lost Morgan. Everyone. She's like, not well, sure what happened to Chopper either, them. but yeah, go find everybody. Zeb wakes up to find himself in a cell with Ez Morgan. He calmly says, "When he's like, get to the brig. We've been locked inside the brig somehow." AP five advises them not to engage with these droids. Hera tells everyone to get off the ship immediately and get back to the ghost. Ezra hurries to rescue Zeb and his Morgan with Chopper leading the way. While making their way back to the cargo bay, however, they sense an approaching sentry droid. Zeb tells them to hide, but as Morgan, I don't know where he got this freaking courage from, he grabs a blaster and just starts shooting down the hallway at the droid. Admittedly, it's a very narrow hallway. His chances of missing were actually pretty remote. Fairly low. We thought that his chances of missing were Unfortunately, AP5 is like, mm, you shouldn't have done that. That's just I told you piss not the rest to engage. of them off. Yeah, don't engage. And they're like, you could have told us, though, that they would wake up on the train. Oh, AP5, AP5 in a very, had a very internal tech moment there. It's been like, I would have thought, I thought it was obvious. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was <laughs> obvious. And also I told you not to. So I thought that you'd be smart enough not to do that. Oh, everything's fine. Hondo and Miss Morgan are trying to load their treasure still onto these cables and race to the ghost, but Melch is missing. And Hondo's like, oh, I guess he fell to his doom. <laughs> I shall spend his portion in his honor. Yeah, like, oh my God, this is just not, <laughs> not a good look for anyone this episode. 
Ezra and Zeb are trying to escape when one of the sentry droids shoots the cable that they're trying to get across on, and they are falling, freaking falling. Zeb, luckily, is super coordinated and grabs hold of the rope, grabs hold of Ezra, and they're eventually able to get back up onto the ghost. They're congratulating each other, and they're like, um, but where's Melch? Hondo and Morgan are fighting over the treasure. They open up the chest, and inside is a brightly smiling Melch. <laughs> Because he knew that Hondo was going to try and ditch him again. So he's like, not this time, motherfucker. Inside the the chest he went. And so... (laughs) I can barely say this line with a straight face. Hondo, like, he's like, oh my gosh, this is great because friendship is the greatest treasure of all. (laughs) And at least Ezra's like, do do you really believe that though? And he's like, kind of? (laughs) Sure, why not? (laughs) Oh my god, yes. Yes. Comedy was had. Oh yes. I was laughing a lot during this episode. Mm -hmm. But, all right, let's move on then to our second holocron, The Will of the Force, where we get Mm -hmm. into the theme or themes from these episodes. Mm -hmm. And Colleen, before you get started, I thought it was kind of interesting that these episodes thematically kind of all tied together. They each deal with kind of a sense of honor or trust Mm -hmm. in their own, Mm -hmm. in their own kind of unique ways. Yes. You know, whether it's this idea of honor among thieves, the culture or the heritage that you may inherit or need to fight for, the idea mm-hmm. of not leaving someone behind or cowardice. Yes. I don't mm-hmm. know. What mm-hmm. did you think? I agree. There isn't like a ton of talk about honor because it's not Atla and we don't have Zuko here in no. Star Wars until you get to the Mandalorians. And then it's a lot about honor and culture and putting family first and putting your country basically first your planet first Mm -hmm. which is really important to fen rao and he doesn't think that he's been betraying mandalore by kind of allying with the empire because he left he's like well i left and we're just trying to eke out existence by ourselves so he's like i'm still honorable the empire is paying me but i don't have to bow to them (laughs) yeah exactly yeah he's like i'm not gar saxon so i'm not as bad (laughs) as him (laughs) people can talk themselves into anything um and leaving no leaving a person behind that's such a a rebel thing too Mm because the empire is like fuck it we can leave whoever we want (laughs) and they will all right heading into our episodes episode seven is about choosing sides fen and rao and sabine both chose sides for different reasons fen actually stuck with the empire because he's trying to protect his men he's trying to protect the protectors because they were loyal to satine Mm -hmm. And that is one reason why they're kind of exiled out to conquer Dawn, because they're not with the Gar Saxon faction. So it's like, mm, he chose his side. He just kind of chose not great. And then Sabine, of course, left the Empire. She chose to, she thinks she's saving her family also by leaving, mm-hmm. which Fen apparently tells, and Gar Saxon says, no, nope, that's not what happened. They're actually on the Empire shit list now because you left. So it, it doesn't work out every time when you choose a side, but I'm super proud of Sabine for sticking to her guns. Absolutely. She knows that she's doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And she is in the end. I think Fen trying to protect his men was also super honorable, but if he had joined the rebellion, some of them probably would not have died. So I think he's also kind of looking at that like, oh shit. But mm-hmm. he also didn't think our Saxon was going to fly in and kill them all. Yeah. Because he thinks that Mandalorians are honorable. And it's like, oh, honey, you know better than that. (laughs) You know better than that. Episode eight, we have the perspective of growing up, the youthful illusions of invincibility. This is so huge here. All three of them have this like delusion of grandeur that they're actually harming the empire in some way. Yeah. And it's like, you are protecting the sympathizers, the rebellion sympathizers on the planet. But... In the grand scheme of things, this isn't that huge. And the only reason that Thrawn put any muscle behind the attack was because Mart was Sato's nephew. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, you're an annoyance, but you're like a mosquito. <laughs> yeah. On an this, elephant. These guys kind of reminded me of there's an episode of, I think it's Next Generation Star Trek. Mm-hmm 
where like these cadets who had been part of this like yes. secret like fighter Wesley's squadron crew. Wesley's crew they like mm. they basically got abandoned and forgotten about their commander was like taken out and the, so they in their minds were still on this like secret mission <laughs> And when they're finally found, they're like, no, we have to carry it out. We have to carry it out. They're like, dude, that's like been over for a year. Yeah. Oh, wasn't there one on DS9 too where Nog got onto a ship with like a bunch of yeah. super cadets? There's been a couple Maybe of those for Star Trek. There's been a couple of those, yeah. Well, mm-hmm. well Wesley's, no, because Wesley's Wesley's crew, was the elite crew of pilots. Wesley's was the elite crew of pilots who tried to pull off that, like, starburst maneuver yeah. or whatever mm-hmm. and tried to cover it up. But, you know, I think Nog's, maybe it was DS9. It's the it's the crew that Nog finds that, Where they're like, all like, we're, we're all teenagers, but we can still fight. They were like, yeah, we lost, but we're, yeah, we're just as strong as, like, anybody. It's like, no, guys, you're not. No. <laughs> you're not. No, you're all oh, poor babies. And most of them died. So <laughs> at least died. at least we got all four and counting our droid friend out yes. of this situation. Next for episode nine, we have accepting authority even when it's your friends and you don't want to. <laughs> Chain of like command, the, damn it. I know, like yes, Ezra, you do deserve to have commands, but Hera made the right choice here. Like you're kind of blind when it comes to Hondo and you mm-hmm. needed a, a much more level head on this mm-hmm. mission. And that was up. Yes, absolutely. So then moving into our series theme, going back to our old standby, that chosen family, we see Ezra work with the different members of his chosen family this week, mm-hmm. different capacities. Um, he gets a great mission with Sabine on Concord on, mm-hmm. and then he's with Zeb on his mission with Hondo and, you know, if you want to count Hondo as that, like, drunk uncle or something like that, part of the family who <laughs> shows up. Oh, Ezra's the one person who hasn't given up on him yet, so he's still in contact. Yeah. You texted Hondo? Uh. <laughs> Actually, Hondo texted me and was like, yo, I got some bombs. <laughs> mm-hmm. Both times, Ezra ends up working really well with the crew, but there's still those growing pains between him and Zeb. And I think it might yeah. be the fact that they actually, they live together. Yeah. And because he sees them as such equals and it's, uh, it just it's that hard. weird dynamic trying to we're accept Zeb's authority. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. But I have no problem ordering you around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's also just great to see him so worried about Chopper that he's willing to yes. use the force to, in front of Gar Saxon to save him. Yes. Mm. That part was cool. I'm like, yes, yes. save your boy. Save your boy. <laughs> and then in Iron Squadron, Ezra gets to see some chosen family members and some actual family members reunites. And he sees mm-hmm. the strong bond that's formed between these crew members. It's yeah. almost like he's seen that the, the Iron Squadron is kind of a weird in-between between like what Ezra would have been if he had stayed on Lothal just yes. like hunting by himself just like yeah. trying to hijack some shipments like mm-hmm. they're a little bit more idealistic yes yeah they still have their innocence in possibly like possibly what maybe would have happened if he instead of like never having met the ghost crew if he had actually stayed on with all at the end of the pilot when they were like yep we'll drop you off at home that's fine <laughs> He may he have turned into to... these guys because he got a taste of what it was like to try and annoy the Empire. Mm-hmm. And then he probably would have ended up dead. Many times over. <laughs> we love you, Ezra, but you would not have survived. No. All right. I think we're ready to head into our third holocron, which is the Galaxy's Populace. We're going to explore the characters and relationships covered in today's episodes. I will kick us off with Sabine. She's using strategy. It takes longer. Come on. Uh-huh. Jeez. Duh. We're starting to get a lot more Mando plot lines and Rebels coming up, which puts Sabine in the forefront. Thank goodness we need more of her. We get a little more information on her situation in Super Commandos. Her family is in disgrace because of her deserting the Imperial Academy. Mm-hmm. And her mother is the one in charge of the family. Sabine proves to Fen Rao, though, that she's not just full of empty words and promises. She's willing to fight for her people, even if they're not Mandalorian. Like, she's willing to put down everything and go back for Ezra. Yeah. And Fen Rao's like, okay, 
this means something like you've proven to me you put your money you where still your mouth are. is yes like he's like i guess you are still a mandalorian mm-hmm. hmm. who would have thought yes speaking of fen Rao, we that ginger mando comes right back in yes. he returns to rebels having been locked up in their brig since his capture way back I, I even forget was that season one or season two now i think it's two i think it's season two mm-hmm. he's sort of bonding with sabine he's whether he wants to or not she's coming to visit him they're playing mm-hmm. games and he's so cool. trying to teach her some lessons mm-hmm. but he does not hesitate to bring up her all of her past failures yeah, he sees fast. something he sees something in her he sees kind of the great mandalorian that she could be and is disappointed mm-hmm. that she chose to leave mandalore behind mm-hmm. and join the rebellion uh yeah. after finding out that gar saxon would have just killed him no matter what rouse sees yeah. that his world needs to be freed from the empire as well mm-hmm. um a little sad when he mentions that mandalorians will be standing long after the empire falls um no. I mean, <laughs> I mean, well, some of them will. Yeah, some of them will have joined a cult. <laughs> and I mean, we don't, we, don't, we don't know what's going on with Bo Katan. We don't know what her yes. story is. We just know that they're all very scattered. Like, if there are any Mandalorians left, they probably are not on Mandalore. Yeah, Mandalore is prob. I mean, Mandalore wasn't exactly a, uh, a luscious paradise <laughs> at not that anymore. point, anyway. No. Definitely not anymore. And we all saw what happened to Concord Dawn. Yes. Oh, I'm very concerned. I'm also very surprised that you're still able to live on that half of the planet. Like, no. I, mean, I know Star yeah. Wars doesn't have a whole, like, physics thing going on, but... No. Not even a little bit. <laughs> You're like, oh, sure, we can have a base here. No, honey, you probably can't. But, oh, speaking of other Mandalorians, Gar Saxon, this fucking guy, he is one of my most hated star wars characters i hate him so much his name literally means spear swordsman so you know he's going to be a pain in the ass for real saxon points out to a germanic group who's also big on invasions you know the anglo-saxon kind of deal so it's basically like a white guy with a sword which (laughs) is basically like what mandalorians are especially if you've (laughs) seen the clone wars it's just a white guy with a sword previsla freaking gar saxon we can go on and on He's actually voiced by Ray Stevenson, who was in Rome with mm-hmm. Kevin McKidd, who voices Fen Rao. Interesting. Connections! And we'll have more <laughs> connections with more Rome people later. Yes. <laughs> in Rebels, that will be coming up. So yeah, Saxon is a member of Clan Vizsla. We'll go over that a little later. He was a chief member of Death Watch and Maul's faction of Mandalorians during the Clone Wars. He's really adept at political maneuvering. Like, he was caught at the end of Clone yeah. Wars and put in jail. So he has finagled his way out and into power with the Empire. He's been ruling since the end of Clone Wars when Bo-Katan was taken out of power. Yeah. And then we have the titular Iron Squadron. Uh, mm-hmm. This this squad started off as Commander, Commander Sato's brother squadron, but mm-hmm. these kids are all that's left. Yeah. They are each of these members is named after people in the U- Lucasfilm universe. So mm-hmm. Mart is named after the story groups Matt Martin. Goody Therese is named after Andy Gutierrez, who is the host of her. Rebels Recon. I love her. And John or Jin was named after John Harper, the producer of the Star Wars show. Mm-hmm. So it's worth noting here that Mart is using his mother's last name, not his dad. He is not Mart Sato showing that he's trying to kind of steer away from that connection. I mean, what do we think about this? What happened that made him want to change his name? His uncle knows about it, so it must have been a pretty big blowout. Yeah, I think something real bad happened (laughs) because he also keeps going on about how he doesn't want to be a coward. And it's like, does he think his dad died in a cowardly fashion? Yeah, does he think his dad was trying to run? Does he think that his uncle ran? Like, what why is he so fixated on this and why would he change his last name Mm -hmm. away from sato it had to have been some sort of teenage like you're not my real dad flip a table and like run away or something and then his dad dies and he's like fuck i mean it is i mean it's possible that maybe he's just he's trying to honor his mother Mm -hmm. and that could be too yeah but i mean it 
when he first sees Sato back on Adelon, it's a it's a tender moment. It's it like so I never in a million years thought you would actually ever come back for me. Yeah. Yeah. I and that's it too. And maybe that's another reason why he changed his last name. Maybe he thinks his dad left him mm-hmm. and his uncle left him. And he's like, I'm alone now because or if you I guess I guess I guess I think maybe the most likely situation in my mind would be that Sato left to become the commander mm-hmm. and got his dad drawn up in this whole it. thing. It got him drawn up and got and his dad got killed, so it cost him that. And he doesn't want anyone to associate him if he thinks if he thinks that Sato leaving was a cowardly move. Right. <laughs> Little does he know. Little does he know. His uncle is a commander in the rebellion. <laughs> yes. And I mean, these kids are really just trying their best to survive and mm-hmm. protect their planet. It's their home. That's what yeah. they keep like, this is our home. We don't want to leave. And this is something mm-hmm. that shows up throughout the Star Wars universe mm-hmm. in shows, books, movies, like everywhere is these people who just don't really fully get it that the empire is coming in and they are going to kill you and they're like no this is our home we're gonna stand and it's like good sentiment like where your head's at just so you know you're going to die die. or be enslaved like the wookies yeah they are just and they are just way over their heads they are in Mm -hmm. so far over their heads they're very loyal to each other which makes for some really sweet moments they take turns trying to save one another throughout the episode their droid r3a3 uh, is an astromech who's just a little bit more timid than Chopper, not quite as willing to go outside. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hysterical. Yes. And then I got to take this one in the next yeah, episode, yeah, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Hato's back. He's Hato's amazing. back. Oh, my God. I'm always yes. happy to see him. Yes. Uh, and he has not changed one bit. <laughs> not at all. He is up to his old tricks, having left Melt behind in the cargo ship, just mm-hmm. trying to take, finding any excuse to try and take the treasure for himself. Yes. Um, and just being totally okay with leaving as Morgan behind, which, yep. be honest, I am okay with that too. If you want, if yes. as Morgan wants to be left behind, that's a great idea. Yeah, I don't, I'm um, fine with that. <laughs> Ezra kind of comes to terms with the fact that he's disappointed in Hondo here he kind of does learn that lesson that hondo yeah. isn't as trustworthy as he maybe thought um but he accepts that that's just who hondo is yeah it's like uh, i'm not gonna try and change it but ugh, yeah. could you be like a little better like just a little yeah. just a smidgen even like an iota of better that'd be good he does say that friends are the, tr- <laughs> the true treasure was the friends we made along the way yes. <laughs> Hondo is always ready, just with a quip or a jibe. Like he's fast, he's quick on his feet, and very quick witted. <laughs> we will always love you, Hondo. We will always accept you into our episodes. Next, we have Ezra and Zeb and their connection here. That big bro, little bro vibes, mm. huge, huge in this episode. It's nice to see that they still have conflict. Like yeah. even though they're family, it's much more realistic to have them at odds then, since they are the brother dynamic here as we're calling zeb like captain whatever captain i was like seriously he was a captain though like in the honor guard <laughs> put some respect <laughs> on zeb's rank <laughs> and he doesn't want to listen to him it's such classic younger as removes like this is not yeah. the more mature as he's kind of regressed here a little bit which hondo probably kind of brings out in him a little bit I do like that Ezra, though, still tries to impress him. Like, he's still trying to impress Seb when he cuts through the door. <laughs> when he's like, oh, my God. Which totally comes back to bite them in the ass later. And he's like, shut the door. I'm so Giant sorry. Hole. I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> it's so good. This episode is amazing. And Zeb, of course, being like, I told you so. Stop. And like, listen to me, please. Oh man, they still do work really well together. Like when they're hanging from the cable, oh, and yeah. Ezra whips out his lightsaber and is like protecting with the deflections. Amazing. Like they're there for each other. They're there to protect each other. Yeah. They're still bros. They're still gonna fight and stuff, but this was at least very cute. Definitely. They went back to Adelon and had a beer at the sunset at Zeg at Zeb's trailer. Yeah. You of age yet? <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> And then lastly, back again for a small appearance, but always amazing, AP5, my man. <laughs> Just protect him at all costs. 
is. He's in, and he's just got that. He's got that Snape drawl. It's just like, <laughs> when he says that the plan has a thirty-eight percent chance of success, and it's a Caden who's like, "I thought you were like some kind of logistics genius," and he's like, "I am. That's why it's thirty-eight <laughs> percent. If I wasn't here, it would be zero. <laughs> it's just a chef's kiss moment." <laughs> I just love, I love him so much. The fact that we got more AP5, (laughs) I'm so here for it. Every single time he shows up, I'm not going to be mad. I am going to be here for it forever and always. Yes. Oh my gosh. Okay. I think we are ready to head into our fourth holocron, which is Finding the Galaxy Together, where we go over our homages and Easter eggs from these episodes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get us started with House slash Clan Vizsla. Mm. Lots of tough looks coming from this family. They are one of the main ruling families of Mandalore. The Vizslas were prime antagonists against Duchess Centian Kreese and her pacifist faction during the Clone Wars. Mandalorian clans kind of work like the families from Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. So like Vizsla and Kreese would be like Lannister and Stark. And they're the highest of the houses. The most noble of the noble houses of Mandalore. Whereas like Ren, Sabine's family, and Saxon are lower level noble families who were aligned with a certain house. And they these two were aligned with House Vizsla. Yeah. Which is why Fen Rao too is like, Ugh. gross. <laughs> gross, Clan Vizsla, I'm Clan Kreese. Like, yes, we know. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, Sabine finally gets her hands on the jetpacks. That thing that every Mandalorian wants, turning her into a serious airborne weapon. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's not the first Mandalorian to crave a jetpack. You know, we mm-hmm. saw Din Djarin salivating over one in Mandalorian. Uh, incidentally, that jetpack was actually owned by Paz Vizsla. Mm-hmm. More Vizslas popping up all over the goddamn all place. All over the place. Sticking with our Mandalore theme, we have Kubikad, which is that holographic game that they were playing in the first episode. They make moves across this kind of 3D board with daggers. <laughs> it's just like daggers have been stuck in the board and they're moving around. Rao and Sabine were originally supposed to be playing Dejaric, but the creators were like, mm, we want to make it more unique to Mandalore because Fen Rao is not going to play Dejaric, let's be honest. Members of the Rebels team jokingly refer to this game as Stabble. <laughs> and i think it's worth noting i think this is the fir- this is the first um canon appearance of kubica but i think it did originate in a legends story yes yes all right next up again more mandalorians got to talk about those talk about that armor and mm-hmm. so boba fett was originally conceptualized as an imperial super commando with all white armor uh, the Rebels it weird. team. Look guys. Yeah. I mean, the Mandalorians and the Stormtrooper armor is very similar. I mean, these guys almost look like snowtroopers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the Rebels team took that concept and made the Mandalorians who were loyal to the Empire have that white armor with just little touches of color. Mm-hmm. And then Gar Saxon still sporting that red that was his signature as a part of Maul's faction. He lost mm-hmm. the horns off the helmet, but... <laughs> he did. He did lose the horns off the helmet which is probably a good thing. Mm-hmm. They're just, no, just stop it, Car Saxon, stop it. Yeah. Next up, we have the Iron Squadron ship, which is a YT-2400 light freighter named Sato's Hammer, a Corellian ship, just like the Falcon. It resembles the Falcon a little bit with like the circular part of yeah. the saucer, but this is like a newer model. One of the, one of the Rebels crew described it as the Chevy van. <laughs> <laughs> like they're everywhere, but they get the job done. In Legends, this really popular character called Dash Rendar has this heavily modified YT-2400 freighter called the Outrider. Great ship name, Dash Rendar. Great ship name. And then we have Thelans. I like really didn't notice this much on my first Rebels watch, but I noticed it a lot more after reading some of the books. The Guti who is in Iron Squadron as a Thelon. This is a rare sentient race who were often subjugated to slavery a lot like the Twi'leks because they're beautiful and they have a lot of like artisans. So they were taken by, yeah, people and put into slavery. No, bad, just bad looks for the Empire all over the place. Besides Guti, there are a few other notable Thelons in Star Wars. Chaz Shattuck from the Alphabet Squadron books. Please read these books. She's amazing. She is a lesbian queen. I love her so much. She actually is a music collector. So you get a lot of music references from Chaz. 
She has mm. tons and she really likes heavy, heavy metal, which is fun. And then we have Lots Rossi from the Clone Wars, who was a bounty hunter, who was kind yeah. of allied with Boba Fett. I really bit. enjoyed her too. Love, love, love her. Next up, the planet Winkathu. Uh, this is a gas giant located near Ord Mantrell. Shout out to the Bad Batch. Uh, its breathable atmosphere was very helpful with this mission. Mm-hmm. The Imperial cargo ship stuck in the atmosphere was a class four container transport uh, that was made in the Kuat shipyards. Mm-hmm. And we should saw more of Kuat. Like yeah, I, I've seen, the, I see it. The, you see the name everywhere and we don't get to spend too much time there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then lastly, those security droids do look a lot like the Dark Troopers from the Dark Forces video game and season two of The Mandalorian. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were originally going to be using probe droids for that episode, but they decided they need something a little scarier. Also, probe droids acting as a security just don't quite work. No, it seems kind of off. I, like, I'm glad yeah. that they chose like these Maybe guys. you would have sent a probe droid to like confirm that the ship goes down. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Yeah, it's fine. All right, y'all, before we move into our next Holocron, we'd like to take a quick break to hear from this week's sponsors. This episode of Bohemian Geek Studies is sponsored by Relief Factor. You know, pain from everyday living, exercise, or just getting older is one of the leading leading causes of trips to the doctor and sleepless nights. It interferes with daily activities that can keep us from spending time with the people we love. If you have everyday pain, it stands to reason you need something you can feel comfortable with taking every day. That's why doctors invented 100% drug-free Relief Factor. Now, tens of thousands of customers are using Relief Factor for every day to become mostly or completely pain-free. 100% drug-free Relief Factor features 14 ingredients that each work on a different metabolic pathway to support your body's natural healing processes to respond to pain and inflammation. Now you can try Relief Factor too. The three-week quick start retail price of almost $70 is now available to our listeners for just $19.95. Head to the link in our show notes to find out more. Start your journey to better health and less pain today with Relief Factor. And we'd also like to tell you about Fiverr. Do you need a freelancer to help with your website, either a designer, or maybe you need someone to help write expert articles and blogs, or an expert presentation designer to help you with that big work project? Look no further than the number one freelance marketplace, Fiverr. You can find designers, programmers, and more within seconds, some for as low as $5 per gig. Fiverr is the ideal tool to help you with pressing projects. Just post your gig or search for freelancers and you're off. Don't deal with the hassle of finding freelancers by yourself. Let Fiverr help you. See the link in the show notes to get started. Please note Bohemian Geek Studies is an affiliate partner of Fiverr. We may receive commissions on purchases and services you buy after you click the link. These commissions help support the growth of Bohemian Geek Studies, and we appreciate your continued support. All right, everybody, it's time to head into our fifth holocron, the newbie from Naboo. Mm-hmm. This is Flo's first time watching Rebels. Like These ones are going to be a little tougher tonight. <laughs> yeah, get pumped. <laughs> we did three of them all, like, all in a row, though, so that's good, because next next week is going to be Get them out of the fire. way. The next couple of weeks are going to be big. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, it's, I'm ready. It's, it starts to get crazy real fast. She has been tasked with watching all the episodes, giving us her takes and her questions. So let's see what our ambassador for Naboo thought about today's episodes. Okay, so three episodes today. To be honest, like I watched these during my daughter's nap time and she like didn't really let me watch them. So <laughs> hmm, so I've got some of Char's takes in here as well. My daughter yes. Charlotte is three and a half. Um, she does not want to nap. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She she had a, a particular take for episode nine. Have you made her uh, a Sabine dress yet? No, not yet. But she actually has a Sabine costume. It doesn't fit her yet. Costume. Okay. Yeah, she does. It just she needs to grow into it. Mm-hmm. She also has a Poe costume, and she's got a Leia costume, nice. and she's getting a dress uh, for this week that I will share with you guys. But it is Star Wars. Yay! <laughs> so very exciting. She loves Star Wars. <laughs> she actually does. She like cuddles me. She's like. Mommy, I just don't like the ones with Darth Vader. And I was like, Darth Vader's probably not going to be in these, baby. And she's like, okay. And she just like sat and she was like, this is great. And I was like, okay, perfect. So somebody liked them. It just wasn't me. (laughs) They were very like fun. Like they're fun and action packed, but they're not like, they don't seem integral to the story. Right. Which is always tough for me, as we know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go through it. Episode seven. I honestly did not even write the episode titles, but whatever. I'm going to call this one Fen Rao's a dick. (laughs) <laughs> okay so, <It's> super hot <laughs> he's okay i he's not like the hottest for me 
And no, like, I think just like the dickishness like makes him really not hot. Mm-hmm. Um, Phantom Two looking great. Just got to shout yep. that out. It's yes. looking really good. Good job, mm-hmm. Sabine. You crushed it. Literally half of these notes just say Fen Rao WTF. <laughs> like literally, it says it numerous times on this paper. Um, okay, I did have one question. So mm-hmm. when Fen Rao takes over Phantom Two mm-hmm. to then land it, I feel like in the past couple episodes and this one, there's been a lot of stunning. And I mm-hmm. don't really understand why they're not shooting to kill at this point. I mean, they're kids. I mean, <laughs> he just fucking kill them. Uh, okay, but like, he because definitely plot. was willing to kill them. Yeah, they have plot armor. <laughs> Okay, but that's it. Yeah, he was willing to leave them behind to I die. I mean, they were going to die. Him he was willing to leave them behind, different. but also in his mind at that point, I mean, they had been holding him prisoner for however long and had, had kind of had the upper hand on him. Like he had had to tell his people to allow the rebel ships safe passage through the system. Right. And he thought he was going back to basically reassume command of his people. And so having a couple of prisoners home. would actually probably be <laughs> good good for him. I mean, I guess it's that he just like left them in the ship with Chopper. This is the thing. Like I have such an issue with like everybody underestimating Chopper at this point. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. why are you just like leaving them with Chopper? Like Chopper because can get them out racism. of anything. Yeah, okay, droidism. <laughs> droidism is a bad. <laughs> yeah. They done a bad. I but I mean, <laughs> yeah, so no, so if we're in his mind, I mean, he thinks he's going in to just, uh, these people are right. going to welcome him back, yeah. so, but he lands, he sees the smoke, and he's, like, kind of right. stunned himself, so that mm-hmm. would be understandable that he just, like, runs out and doesn't necessarily think about them, other than having disarmed yeah, them. but again, him. like, why didn't he, whatever, I understand, like, the, maybe I understand the, like, hostage situation aspect that you're giving me, but, like, did he really need both? I don't know, and, like, I, I just don't really buy that you're like selling a Jedi to the Empire would probably be useful. Yeah. He probably would be a little hesitant to kill a Jedi too, just because he worked with them. Like, and I mean, they're so young. If they and is he older, just not killing Sabine because she's a Mandalorian? Because he seemed pretty pissed at her. I mean, her family, if they found out that he killed her, would probably not be happy. Yeah, you, you don't want Ursa Ren after you. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know anything about that, but like, it sounds like she's pretty estranged from her family. So I, I DK. Okay. The Imperial Mandalorians look super cool. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like that Beskar was popping. It looked great. I mean, I, at least I'm hoping they've got Beskar. It seemed like they were in like, yeah, that's Beskar. Real Beskar. Okay. Um, okay. Gar Saxon is an asshole. Yes. yes. Really yes, don't like is. him. No, he can fuck right off. <laughs> yeah. He needs to stop. Like immediately. I really don't like that guy. Fen Rao calling Ezra a pawn was not really good. tough. Yeah, not good. That was just like, who are you? This Get out tough, of here. Tough looks for Fen Rao. <laughs> really <laughs> tough looks. I loved Sabine with the jetpack, especially when she's like, I've always wanted one of these and just like <laughs> popped it on. Mm-hmm. Like no installation required. It just like slides right in. Yep. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Loved it when she was like, I was using strategy. It takes longer. (laughs) (laughs) Their canter is so good. (laughs) That was so, so good. Um, Yeah, which is like something that Ezra kind of needed to hear, right? Because strategy is not really his strong suit. No. The next note says, what the fuck, Fen Rao again? (laughs) Um, Sabine, like, being all subservient, pretending like she was um like giving up and like Mm -hmm. giving herself in was pretty intense like she was a pretty good actress there i was impressed and i had honestly forgotten all about the jetpack and i was like how is she getting out of this one so that was pretty exciting (laughs) okay this Mm -hmm. is the best part of the episode coming up i think i know what it is (laughs) (laughs) okay so so the powers of the jetpack right and she grabs Ezra, and Re- Ezra gives off. A- <gasps> oh, <laughs> girl's touching me! And it was just like Boner City over there. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> Holocron City. It was so good. He is Holocron and like crazy later. Yeah. Oh, that <laughs> night he Holocroned hard to that memory. Um. Yes, that was amazing. I just like his eyes got huge. He was just like what is happening 
So that was yep. really, really great. I just really liked the whole sequence of like Sabine flying, holding him, Chopper flying, holding Ezra. Mm -hmm. um, that was so cool. My next one's just says I love Rally. that look. I love Go that ahead. look of Ezra almost like surfing on Chopper. Yeah. Yes, that was so cool. That was really, really cool. Chopper just like always coming in clutch. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like he's they're all dead it, without he's Chopper. <laughs> he's amazing. Um, that is officially not true in the Bad Batch too. <laughs> oh, okay. Good, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, yeah, basically the end of this episode, like obviously Fen Rao comes back, takes them, is like joining the family, but like, I don't trust him as far as I can throw him. I really don't like him. I feel like maybe it's the haircut. I'm just like, I really don't trust your haircut. <laughs> I can't like I the military buzz. Yeah, well, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I never trust those people, but <laughs> um i just feel like he flipped a little too fast like he was really against sabine and then he's like oh yeah i hate this guy too so i guess like the enemy of my enemy or whatever yeah. but it's like you left them like you left them stranded you he took kind, the ship yeah, and went yeah i think he kind of likes sabine he doesn't want to <laughs> yeah he's got that like really grudging sassy. respect for her and yeah but yeah he does he flips a little quickly but he's been with him a really long time like he's been in that yeah, cell but, forever but grudgingly like it's not like yeah. he's like enjoying his time there and being like oh you know what like this is this is the better side to be on he's like yes. i hate you guys and you held me hostage okay. that's such a mando thing to be like well gar saxon's a bigger prick than you guys so i guess i don't <laughs> know of. i just feel like leaving them stranding them was really a dick move so like yes. i'm I'm not ready to forgive him for that. Seems like Ezra is forgiving very quickly. So is Sabine, but like, I'm not there. So I'll agree Ezra's, with you. I think it's quick to forgive. So, I mean, it was however long ago that he got put in that cell, a check-in with him, maybe like halfway between then and now, just to kind of remind you that he was there, like a conversation yeah. with Sabine before now would have made this turn seem a little bit. Totally. Easier. And honestly, like, I don't even remember how they got him in the first place. Came it feels like, like it was forever to a ship and chucked him out of his own ship yeah i honestly i don't even remember so then when he showed up i was like i had a vague memory this and then, the like i flow. recognized the like place but mm -hmm. this is the thing Flo. you think all these are side quests but everything in rebels comes back and i and actually like, I mean that literally notes, everything like, will come back yeah. damn it <laughs> remember well, Fenro now very much <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna be talking about people coming back in episode nine because i just wanted to kill myself honestly like i'm not even kidding yeah episode nine is it's a little rougher i don't care right. we <laughs> yeah gotta get of course episode eight. doesn't care because of course oh my god all right let's go to episode eight mm -hmm. iron squadron this one i actually put down the title because i was able to i again i had a three and a half year old laying on my chest for most of this so writing happened like at a very awkward angle um <laughs> Okay, this first note says Mart Mallon equals Space Justin Bieber. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. The hair is like so perfectly swooshy. I'm super into it. It was supposed to be like 1970s um, hair, like Beatles. Oh, was it? Monkeys. Yeah, that was their original concept. <laughs> That's hilarious. He definitely yeah. just looked like a California surfer boy. So, yeah. I mean, that's that's my frame of reference there. Like, every guy in my middle school had hair like that. <laughs> it's pretty pretty good. Except with mm -hmm. frosted tips, because that was the thing. Oh, yeah. Always. Duh. Um, Never okay. get the frosted tips. You would look great. You should do them now. Very <laughs> Anderson. <laughs> Let's all talk Anderson to doing frosted yeah. tips. <laughs> Everybody, um, once we get to 6,000 downloads, Anders will frost his tips. <laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> okay. Next, so they're on their ship, right, with the Iron Squadron. Ezra, mm -hmm. Sabine, Chopper have gone over. Were they eating space pizza? This is what I really need to know. Looks like a waffle. It's, it's some sort it was, of rations. Yeah, some sort of like, like MRE or something. It looked like wood, but it also looked like a pizza. Yeah. And I was very confused as to what they were eating. So that was all confusing. Then... I just wrote Thrawn. That was exciting to see Thrawn again. Mm -hmm. Again, he knows the whole plan without even like batting an eye or like saying more than five words. 
Mm -hmm. that man has the flattest diction i've ever heard in my life (laughs) yes oh yeah he doesn't give very much away with his voice (laughs) he is unfazed he oh yeah he just is there also i feel like i'm either getting more used to his forehead or they have toned down the forehead (laughs) and i can't you're getting used to it Mm. he's slowly pulling you in you're getting more and more attracted to him just like colleen (laughs) <laughs> I, I, I don't know if it'll happen for rebels mine only happened after reading the books i just feel like the blue skin red eye combo is like very jarring mm-hmm. and i'm like very freaked out by it and also i feel like he's hey, combined like with a the very... white unicorn he's an american boy <laughs> okay however he also looks like a sexualized smurf which like i have issues with i did not really understand this plot line so i'm gonna be honest what is wrong with this kid? Like, and why does he have a death wish? Mm, he's a teenager a, who yeah, he's a, yeah, he's a teen with just nothing doesn't, to lose. doesn't understand. Yeah, he, like, does, I, he thinks he's invincible. I mean, that's the whole... Well, okay, so you could definitely tell that he didn't understand because he thought everything was a Star Destroyer. Right. And they were like, no, like, this is definitely not. No, no, no. This is like, honey. And then they're like, that's it. Okay, so I get that. His parents are dead, right? Mm-hmm. he's related to sato he's the mm-hmm. nephew or he's something, the nephew right? okay nephew. how did he end up there why so that's is he his home that's him? their home planet i know but how does he have a ship he's like two years old i think it was his dad's because it's named like the sats well i'd have to check my notes again it's named like something sato yeah i okay. think it's a, it's, is, it's, it's their ship his but his parents are dead so is this like a revenge thing? Like, did the Empire kill his parents and now he's like doing this? Because he didn't seem like he really like had a dog in the fight. He was just like, fuck right. the police, you know? Like he was just like, a little bit. I hate authority and I'm just gonna like blow up cargo. Well, kind of, his, and I mean, this his is- His dad was killed by the Empire. So that's yeah. part of it. And this is kind of like romanticizing the idea of being the hero, right? They have yeah. du- they have sure. successfully hit a couple of these Imperial ships and okay. forced them to run. So as a teenager, you are very much... <laughs> so like... this is like... This is kind of like The Outsiders. He's like Dallas from The Outsiders. That's a good, yeah, that's a good analogy. Just, or like yeah. even West Side Story gang kids being like, I can't die. Everything's fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. He's just got this that... Is teenage delusions of invincibility and um, they've had a few wins so they think they're even cooler like, but there's only three of them mm-hmm. there's only three were there, of them. More, were there the more of them at a time that have died or they just started off with three they're just like this i think is it's it. i think it's just been these three yeah his I, dad's I mean, whole squadron was killed because that was the iron squadron i feel like even as a teenager you know that three is not a solid number to go against the empire three plus droid. but i think they just so they just don't have an actual concept because and this gets into a couple of things i think number one that a lot of people even if they have like a ship like this they don't necessarily travel that far they don't have like we as the audience and like the ghost crew have gone all over the galaxy these people don't really know about life outside their own system Mm -hmm. a lot of them have probably never actually left that one planet yeah Okay. So I you've got that. that. It actually kind of reminds me. So I've been on a major reading kick lately. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, Star Wars yeah. books. <laughs> yeah, he has. He has. <laughs> I just finished my ninth one in the last like 11 days. <laughs> Dang. That Goodreads but, challenge is looking good. But um, in Battlefront Twilight Company, okay. this, this company of rebel soldiers captures an Imperial governor and logistics operator. And she's giving them information on targets and saying, yep, hit here, hit here, mm-hmm. hit here. And they're looking at her like, what, what are you doing? Like, why is all of this like relevant? How will this help us in this greater mission? And she just like looks at them with the almost like puppy dog face. Like, guys, you do not understand the scale that is the Empire and its logistics machine. You just have no concept of it. And I think this Bureaucracy. is the same thing. These yeah. kids don't understand the actual size of the galaxy, the actual scale of this conflict. They yeah. think that taking out a single cruiser is at the same scale of Luke right. eventually blowing up the Death Star. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
I just feel like maybe it's a little bit tricky for me because we have seen kids who came from nothing then get like a very clear picture. Like we saw Anakin who came from nothing, who had definitely did not have a worldview. No, but he was brought to Coruscant. He was, but like, right. So I feel like we believe that. Mm -hmm. And then we saw the same thing with Luke. Like Luke came from nothing on Tatooine. All of a sudden, like is a hero for the rebellion. And then we see this kid who like is kind of stuck in ignorance and it's kind of like, well, why? But I guess we see Ezra like trying to explain that to him where he's like, well, I was, I didn't want to leave my planet either. Yeah. It's like, does this guy even know like where Lothal is or like? Probably not. Probably not. Probably probably like Lothal. What? Right. (laughs) Where the fuck is that? I would say the best part of this episode was Chopper and R3. (laughs) Love that R3. Chopper just like shoving R3 was R3's hilarious. like I don't wanna yeah that it's was like, pretty funny yeah. also <laughs> them just like fighting right at the beginning where yeah. R3's like this is my shit bitch that was pretty funny like Chopper's that. like you can't fix shit well, get out of the way but actually like why is R3 there <laughs> yeah, I mean, I although to be he fair knows, Chopper like also do didn't some fix stuff. It. yeah I mean Chopper's yeah. probably better just because he's had Hera to right learn from but yeah r3's like i think he's more like a baby droid so what happens to this mark kid now like is he just like hanging out with sato i i don't know but oh. definitely remember that he's around yeah <laughs> okay all right i feel like this is gonna be a thing where it's gonna be like mart's gonna join like sabine's old friend and it's gonna be like all the people back together <laughs> that like you forgot about because we haven't seen them in a million years all right Everything uh, okay. will come back eventually. Gotta so. Sprinkle, sp- keep sprinkling. Just keep sprinkling. Okay. All right. All right. I just, I can't with this. Okay. <laughs> and then we get to episode nine. Nine is that nine is fun. <laughs> that is mostly what nine is. And yes, give, it like, is. The, the Zeb Ezra conflict a little bit more, but okay. for the most part, so, it's just like, what's happening? If I was watching this week by week, right? As it was coming out, one episode a week, correct? on on disney Disney xd XD? okay Mm -hmm. so if i turned on disney xd and i was like oh my god guys it's rebels night like i can't wait i got my popcorn ready my like capri sun or whatever okay if episode nine came on i would throw something at my tv (laughs) i'd be like nothing happened can we not (laughs) um okay so first of all pig man comes back yeah, right? as, as Morgan. Morgan. Oh, I, I hate him. I hate, him I so hate that guy so much. This I is do too. Right, this is right when Char came into the room. And I'm like, Char, that's Pig Man. So then Charlotte decides to give everybody else a name. Because I was like, well, his name's not really Pig Man. It's just what I call him. So let me just tell you, and this is for you, Anders. <laughs> she has decided that Hondo <laughs> should be called Prickly Man. <laughs> She's like, mommy, he's got so many pricklies on his chin. Like, he's going to be prickly man. And Hera is green girl. So <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. It was pretty good. Pretty good. Um, those are literally my only two notes on the episode because <laughs> I had a kid on me. Um, but basically, this was just a silly episode. Like, it was. It was so funny. much fun. Very silly. I, I fully agree that it was fun, that it was very funny, that Hondo had some like really good one liners for sure. I did like the Zeb Ezra conflict. Clearly, like Ezra is very reluctant to take orders from anybody else. And it seems like Zeb is kind of pissed off about it or like fed up with it. He's just like Ezra was just being a dick. Ezra Ezra was a dick. dick. Yeah, yeah, Mm -hmm. for sure he was. But also like Zeb lives with him. Like Zeb knows how Ezra is. And I feel like maybe Zeb should like know better ways of how to get through to Ezra Mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah. Because it just seems like what he was doing was not working. Now, I also don't really understand why Ezra was that upset that Zeb got it in the first place. Like, I understand that Ezra came up with the plan or whatever, Mm -hmm. or like came up with the mission. Mm -hmm. And obviously is the one who contacted Hondo because everybody else hates Hondo and is like, Hondo, get the fuck away from me. Which (laughs) is kind of annoying, like that Ezra even did that, like without telling anybody. Uh, Right? I mean... I yeah. don't know about that. I mean, He's, they all have their own intelligence assets. Yeah, they're supposed to kind of look up, look out for things like this, but then they see it's Hondo and they're like, God damn it. <laughs> I just feel like Ezra knows that Hondo has fucked them over repeatedly. And but so they, but like, like he says, they've always come out on top. 
Yeah, luckily. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent, right? Like just through luck. It's not like, and I don't even feel like Hondo's like giving them good information as an asset. He's no, just like I mean, there. He he gives it to them, but then he always like back pedals because he, he has to cover them. for his ass. Yeah. <laughs> Right, like this one, he's like, oh, there's bombs, but also treasure. And it's just like, okay, like, did they really need the bombs that badly? Like, yes, yes. <laughs> I, I just feel like, okay, so maybe instead of like going to find Hondo, like, how about you find a bomb maker? Mm-hmm. Like, how about you recruit a fucking bomb maker? Instead they're of all in the, Hondo? They're, they're all in the Empire service. That's not even possible. All the bomb manufacturers? Are you kidding? The weapons manufacturers? Yeah, they're they're all pretty on very controlled Empire places. I mean, they can I mean, get weapons, but they might not be as reliable. Yeah. So, so their plan is just to steal bombs for the rest of this war. I mean, they could have gotten, they had Visago, which is where they were getting so much of their right. like, stuff from, but now they don't have him as an asset anymore. Right. So okay. Remind like me what happened with that guy. Fizago. We will see him again. <laughs> we will I see figured. him again. But the last time we'll we saw him, him was when they had the. Uh, Lothal. Yeah, they had the so. ion disruptors and the walkers came. It was the episode with C three PO and Leia, or not yeah. with Leia? Was that Leia's episode? Okay, and Visago knows no. that Ezra is a Jedi. Visago does yes. know Ezra is a Jedi, but he's okay. holding on to that still. Yeah. Right. Okay. Got it. So he's on Lothal, where they can't go. And he can't get off. You'd think they'd be able to find like a backdoor dealer, but then it could turn out to be like Benicio Del Toro's character from um, Last Last Jedi. Jedi, Yeah. Who could turn them over. So it's very iffy, like what they could do. But then Hondo's super iffy also. They got, they're basically in a position where they have to take what they can get. Like supplies, weapons, ships are a constant problem for the rebellion. I just so feel like, like very little bang for your buck. Kind of there situation. are people out there making things. Like if we take a look back at like Solo, like Enfys Ness was out there <clears> making <throat> shit. Yes. So we don't like, know where she is. Right why now. can't they just like find somebody like I mean, or just like read a book? How about you read a book about how to make a bomb? Somebody you learn still how to need make the ma- bomb. You still need the materials. Yeah, and, some, I think the proton the bombs are really rare. Like, I don't remember. There's not a lot of talk about them. because like it cannot be this hard. Making a bomb cannot be this hard. People make Molotov no, but cocktails. Also, also remember the that these aren't just like, ma- these aren't just like regular bombs. I know they keep calling them bombs, but I'm pretty sure they're like torpedoes. These are the things that you load into an X-Wing to shoot yeah. down the Death Star. It's very specific. Like, it these need to be, like... these need to come off of like a machine manufacturing line to All work right. properly we need to get ap5 on this immediately even, <laughs> yes even thank you yes, that, that could is work. true like there's really no better way than hondo right to well, keep I mean, they, going like i know you love yeah. him anders oh, I, I, do love him. I do love him i know that you stand him so hard but like he is repeatedly fucking them over like mm-hmm. repeatedly he is. He doesn't hear though. He doesn't fuck them over here. He just fucks over no. as Morgan, and he tries to fuck over Melch, which yeah. I do not yeah. actually forgive him for because Melch is adorable. Yeah. Melch is amazing, and he <laughs> left him for dead. And I was like, Hondo, if he, want, if I he know wants this... to fuck over as Morgan, I'm fine with it. Oh yeah, sure. Then, yeah, sure. shove as Morgan like, off the platform. <laughs> I just feel like he still wasn't helpful. Yeah. And even when he was like, "My treasure," where's like he's a blundering fool in this one. He is. Yes, now, and it's I'm... hilarious. <laughs> It, it, it was funny. funny. It was funny and cute. Charlotte loved it. She thought it was so funny. So I fully agree with that. I just this was for the like... kids. Yeah, yeah. And that's all. That's all I care about at this. Right. I'm like, yo, he's funny. It, it's not a top tier. No, it's episode. definitely not a top tier <laughs> Rebels episode. I'll definitely go with you on that. I just feel like if you're gonna win this war, you need better people than Hondo on your side. That's how I feel. Sorry, sorry, Hondo. There's like. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's so hard. I mean, a lot of people are dead, too. That's like, oh, the Empire's killing everyone. <laughs> like, that, that could be Well, they're never us. killing our main people because they keep setting it to stun. So there you go. Also, well, they, like, they, they do want to catch Ezra. One, so I was that, is, that is difficult when you don't get a callus. We didn't get callus I mean, and we barely got Kanan. Kanan, like, did nothing in any of these episodes. No. Mm-hmm. I think Freddie Prince Jr. might have been, like, doing something because sometimes he'll 
Kanan isn't quite as forward in the plot. He had like in one three. line. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a bummer because I I really missed him and like I feel like Hera has been taking a huge step back. It seems like this season is very Ezra Sabine focused with like yes. some Zeb peppered in. Definitely yes. a lot of Chopper. We're getting a ton of Chopper, which is really nice. Mm-hmm. But like, I do miss the adults. Yeah. Yeah. I just feel like the adults should be taking care of some shit. It seems like they're always sending the kids out to like their deaths. <laughs> it's like, maybe we don't do that. But I do it for this, this is a very Sabine centric season, I would say. It Which is great, and I love her, but I, we need I the like other maybe, people. Maybe like I just didn't get enough character development about her in the first and second seasons. That it's like, how is she this good? Like we oh, got like a good. little bit of it. Oh, she good. She's good. she's amazing, but it's like I, I wish I had gotten more Sabine peppered into one and two, mm-hmm. so that I could like buy this one more. Mm-hmm. But anyways, I, I'm not gonna say I liked these episodes they were fine again I guess I, they better build on these uh, that's all I gotta say because th- this was I mean yes they will <laughs> maybe like, not, not as there. much maybe not as much on nine but I mean stuff that happens there is important. I mean yeah stuff that happens there is important and do they end up getting the bombs like I feel like that yeah. was even yes. clear Oh, yeah, because they, they started yeah. with the bombs. They got like five or six hauls of them before they yeah. had to abandon ship. I mean, is that a lot? Like, I feel like you're going to go one had those four. Like... Yeah. Six, six, didn't they? I just feel like you're going to go through those in like maybe one battle. Probably. Probably. And if you don't have access to a factory, then this is what you got to do. This yeah. is what I'm saying. Why Go build a factory. I, I straight up, I don't understand. With what money? <laughs> With what money are they paying any of these people? How are these people eating? Oh, nobody's getting paid. Yeah, no, they're not getting paid. <laughs> so, so how are they eating? How? What? They're stealing what's ration cubes. Yeah, they have to steal. They're they're basically stealing like everything. Although, like the senators are probably helping. Like Alderaan does a lot of like helping missions where they like drop supplies yeah. and shit, and they're like, oh yeah. no, the supplies they ended up in the rebel hands i don't know or they've ah. got or they're or they're funneling money that they can use to maybe like buy some fuel yeah but you also have but to i mean they also have to be careful like even anything that they buy they have to do it kind of piecemeal you can't be like mm-hmm. here's a check signed by the rebellion sure <laughs> god damn it i just feel like i'm not getting the uh the nitty-gritty of i i think i need to see the books like that's what I'm really like looking for. I'm just like, how many people are in this? What is happening? What's their uh, position? Believe... What are they good for? Bail Organa's paying a lot of people, I think. And his wife, Breha, the Queen of Alderaan, yeah. is yeah. is doing the books. I would guess that they're yeah, she definitely she's doing all the books, but I yeah. think that that's where a lot of their money is coming from is like Bail Organa, Mon Mothma, who are wealthy in and of themselves, so they can be like Here's some money skimmed off the top of. Okay, things. so why can't they build a factory with that? Oh, they'd get caught real yeah. quick. They can't stay in one place either. That's another problem is that the rebels can never stay put. Wait, but they've got the spider planet. Now. Yeah, for now. Mm-hmm. Okay, so build a factory there. Team. <laughs> Okay, a spider fueled factory. The spiders just like <laughs> the spiders run the like... machines with their own little click clacks. And then there's like the weird moose guy. He could do something. How about we like employ him? Ooh, Honestly, yeah. I'm, I'm I mean, just like Yeah, uh, if they put a factory on that planet, Bendu would freak the fuck out. That's true. Bendu needs to calm the fuck down. He won't. All right. He needs to get I'm saying these rebels, they like need a flow to just like kick them in the ass and be like, let's go team. We can't keep stealing shit. Like we need to. But they don't have, they don't have the resources to permanently hold a place like that. Like as soon as word gets out, as soon as anyone notices, you have to abandon it. But how long have they been there now? At Adelon? Sure. Is that what it's called? At least six six or seven months from the end of season two. So this is actually one of the bases that they're at the longest, at least the rebels that are there, because I don't think they're on Yavin very long either. No, they're not on Yavin that long. They, they're they're not like on Hoth that long either. Long. Yeah, they're really Later. not on Hoth that long. They're God, like jumping all over the place. And then they're out in space. They don't have a base. They're just operating from the fleet. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess the people who are on 
I'm trying to think of anywhere where there's like a more stable base and there really is not. Mm -hmm. They're just kind of like going out to these weird semi bases where they can hang out for like a week or a couple days and then they all beat feet again and they're out of there. I just feel like (laughs) manufacturing should be a priority for these people or finding manufacturers who can be bribed or are like somehow like more in like the outer rim and can like kind of stay out of sight from the empire more or less like this why is are true. we not like i don't we know distribution like, where's mm-hmm. our distributors this is this is definitely true and i'm and i'm with you on that 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 would be great that the would problem be so is hard. a lot of the people that you could bribe are no longer we'll there. Turn you in. But can they you, like, turn you in. okay? They will turn what you in, or like... they've already been caught, and the empire has taken over their oh, shit, their no. sisters. Count what Didion about... went through, and he just uh, centralized a lot of manufacturing. <laughs> what about like the crime syndicates? Wait, hmm. you, <laughs> you don't mean don't like Hondo? Get up with them either. <laughs> Hondo is not a crime syndicate. Hondo is Hondo. I'm saying like. The huts will turn them in yeah. like crazy. Yeah, the huts will turn them. What if you're bribing them? The they empire would pay bribe more. them enough. Yeah, I mean, they could probably get like a renegade hut to give them some money, but even then, it would be like, oh fuck. Maybe zero guess, will like, help them out. There has to be a crime syndicate that, like, because they're only in it for the money. Yeah. So mm-hmm. if they, they're they willing want, to give yeah. more money than the empire has been, like, does the empire really have every crime syndicate in their pocket? Not like not necessarily way, in their they, pocket, but I mean, if it's like them. they let if, them continue their slavery, which is a lot of what the crime. I mean, want. I mean, we spent a lot of time now talking about how the rebels they while they have some funding, they do have a money problem. Sure. The empire has the the empire, the imperial treasury, and if a hut calls them up and is like, "Hey, I know where the rebel where the rebel base is, mm-hmm. and I can sell you two Jedi." I don't think the Alliance has enough money to, to outbid yeah, the Empire on that one. <laughs> All right, I'll keep brainstorming. <laughs> yes, we need a distributor, like for real. Yeah. <laughs> I just feel like we, we're always stealing fuel. We're always stealing like guns. We're stealing yes. ships. We're stealing yes. bombs. Like steal we're always everything. doing that. It's like, it's every episode we're stealing something instead of being like, mm-hmm. how can we build these things? And that's big in the books too. They basically are like the rebels keep like either blowing shit up or stealing shit, and we gotta stop them because we gotta give them a hand slap. And okay, here's where I'm actually like, kind. They had that one ship maker who gave him the B wing, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's like okay, so like you thought about like finding somebody Mm -hmm. with talent, like Mm -hmm. recruiting people who have a certain talent to the cause, right? They did think about it for that one second, that one episode. And then well, they've done like, it. They've eh. got a lot of talented people. Now they also yeah. need they also need the the raw materials. Yes. All right. Yeah, that's that's hard too. They've they got will actually... try to keep recruiting people too. I mean, I think most people y'all are giving me a lot of excuses as to why they're not being successful. Right. I mean, now. they had. At they the only battle, have a one percent chance of success. At the, uh, the at the battle at the battle of Yavin, they had there were 30, 30 fighters that went up. They had several pilots left over because they didn't have enough ships. They had like five or six extra X wings or Y wings laying around, but they couldn't fly. They were all broken, and they didn't have the they didn't have the materials to fix them. That's why Porkins died. (sighs) You know what what Wedge managed to do it. Hmm? Wedge Wedge managed to to compensate. Yeah, but Wedge is like an ace pilot. Wedge Wedge, is like Wedge can get it though. I yeah, think Wedge is classified it. as an ace too, at least. He ways. is, but Wedge is like a prodigy. They're yeah. even like he hasn't been flying that line. Holy shit! Look at that kid go. <laughs> yep, I just finished from a certain point of view. So, <laughs> yes, that's where. Yeah, oof, that's a tough chapter to get through. All right. Oh man. All right. We are going to figure out this distribution problem. We will figure this fucking out. I mean, I will not rest. The Ravenclaw is on it. Gonna break the case. Okay. So we're going to head into our sixth holocron, the conjecture at the cantina. This is where we ask our questions about the episode and look at some wider Star Lords lore, even though we already just did that. Freaking rebellion, get your shit together. Mm -hmm. Uh, The first one, I'm going to cover what did Dave Filoni and crew have to say about these episodes. We're going to kind of go in a little bit with Mandalorians because this is going to be a really big, important thing coming up for basically the rest of the show. Yep. Why are most Mandalorians following Gar Saxon? Seriously, he's the dick who's aligned with the Empire. Pablo Hidalgo said that stability is the main driving force. 
for the people of Mandalore and in the Mandalore sector, basically, there isn't as much constant infighting as there was during the Clone Wars. Like they got done with a massive civil war. The Empire puts somebody in place and it's like, here you go. Everything's going to be peaceful now. Most of the citizens are going to be like, good. I want to be able to just go to my job and live my life and, and not be blow secure. Up. And not blow up. That would be good. Not every Mandalorian is a fighter like Fenrau or Sabine. They're more of like the elite nobles who have all this fighting experience and know how to fight. Whereas most people in Mandalore just want to live in peace. So that's kind of where they are with Mandalore, why they would be fighting against people like Fenrau who are like, we're the protectors though. We're supposed to protect the person in charge, but no, fuck you, Gar Saxon. We're going to our own busted up moon. Yeah. Speaking of that busted up moon, mm, they did that to themselves, Flo. That is a civil war against Mandalore against Mandalore situation. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like that's happening a lot. It does. And actually, I thought for this episode, it might be worth, especially with what we know what's coming. Um, to No, we don't. People. What's well, coming? Well, we know that Mandalore, like Colleen said, Mandalorians seem, are probably going to be a major factor moving forward. Okay. <laughs> that it do just, a check-in. <laughs> yeah, we're just going to do a check-in and kind of go through what we have seen on screen it, throughout Clone Wars and Rebels like up until this point um, okay. with the Mandalorians. So we start yeah. out pre-Clone Wars, the Mandalorians had kind of always been in this constant state of war. They're either fighting each other or they were even long time ago fighting the Jedi. Spoiler alert, the Jedi won. Unlike the Clone Wars. What? <laughs> so eventually... The Duchess Satine and her group of pacifist Mandalorians managed to win power and try to change the Mandalorian cult culture to move away from violence. This is during the Clone Wars that this happens. Yes. She wins power. Um, then Death Watch, a terrorist group under the command of Pre Vizsla, attempts to terrorize and overthrow the government because they want to return to the ancient warrior ways of Mandalore. Ultimately, Death Watch will align with Maul and become a part of his shadow collective that he was building. Together, they take out Satine and take over the planet. And then Maul kills Pre Vizsla, who thought that he would be able to take out Maul in one-on-one -on -one combat because he's a dumbass. <laughs> so fucking ridiculous. <laughs> but then Palpatine gets wind of what's going on on Mandalore and is like, hmm, Maul? Really? <laughs> So Palpatine goes to Mandalore, <laughs> captures Maul, defeats him in combat, and kills his brother Savage Opress, mm -hmm. which ultimately creates a bit of a power vacuum and plunges Mandalore into a civil war. I believe that is the one that takes, that's the civil war that takes out half that moon, right, Colleen? I think so. I'd have to go back and look. Yeah, it's not their first, it's not their first civil war. <laughs> Yeah, no, there's, uh, there's so many civil wars, there's it's really a, hard to say yeah, which one took it out. <laughs> um, so some of the remaining members of Death Watch will ultimately break Maul out of captivity. Uh, that is during the comics. And he returns to rule Mandalore for the final season of Clone Wars. Yeah, Bo-Katan <laughs> Kryze, <laughs> Satine's sister. Um, gets, who we know from The Mandalorian. Who we do know, yes, who we know from Katie Sackhoff from The Mandalorian. Um, she recruits the Republic, who sends newly returned Ahsoka Tano and a battalion of clone troopers, including Rex, um, to lay siege to Mandalore at the end of the Clone Wars. They capture Maul, and a bunch of stuff happens after they leave on the ship. But what happens back on Mandalore is bo is placed in control of the government. Then, obviously, the Empire rises, and she will now she will not bow to them, so Bo-Katan is ultimately deposed, and the Empire puts Gar Saxon in charge of the planet. Yep. So, for the past... I mean, that means Gar Saxon... 15, 15 years? Yeah, 15 years Gar Saxon's 16. been kind of in control of Mandalore, and mm -hmm. before Yeah, we don't that, know how long like... Bo-Katan was in power, but yeah. But for... Also... I mean, for... For five or six years there, they were just constantly like power struggling, changing, 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 all back and forth. But and that is where we currently are. For this long. Yeah. Oh, Mandalore. Oh, boy. I'm still just like constantly shocked that they're taking off their helmets, to be honest. <laughs> well, man, like, 
Din is the weird one. <laughs> He's the yeah, not Din's the, the weird way. one. He is the when they say, that's putting his helmet. When we'll they say child when they call him a child of the watch, that is Death Watch, the terrorist cell. Basically. <laughs> was trying yeah, to take over the planet. It's like a weird offshoot of Death Watch. It's the radicalized radicals. Yeah. You're like, oh, saying? here was our weird warrior cult, and now we're gonna get even more culty. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, all right, guys. Well, I think that is where we are going to leave it for today. So tune in with us next time as we continue our Rebel Season 3 coverage with some uh, pretty shocking reveals that are just a little too spoilery for even us to even mention oh. here. So we're just going to we're just going to let that go. God, <laughs> I hope that down. Ezra and Sabine get together. That's all, I'm <laughs> all I want. Ship, ship, ship. <laughs> but until then, please follow us wherever you get your podcast. Leave us those five-star reviews. Check out our website at bohemiangeekstudies.com. You can catch all of our episodes. Enjoy Colleen's Book Corner, where she reviews Star Wars literature. And contact us through email and social media. And as always, keep telling other nerdy knights to join us. That really does help. You can also head over to ForgottenEntertainment.com. Check out all the offerings in the Forgotten Entertainment family, including yet another Star Wars podcast, where we just finished up our rewatch of these films of the Star Wars canon. And until next time, treasure proton bonds and jetpacks up and keep those episodes screaming. Yeah, Flo, <laughs> smile. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> just saying, nobody smiled as hard as Ezra with that jetpack up. Woo! It was the only thing going up, let me tell you. The jetpack went off, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, man. Uh. <laughs> Y'all are wild.